a very warm welcome to everyone present for this amazing lecture uh, that is planned uh, by our team. And thank you so much, Deepika Bhatia, ma'am, for accepting our invitation to be a speaker of today's session. I'll now request Meera Kumar Menon, a doctoral scholar with Team CSP, to please introduce Deepika, ma'am, and on the topic of the day. Uh, thank you, Niharika, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to have you today with us, uh, Deepika, ma'am. Uh, so a few words about the speaker. Uh, Ms. Deepika Bhatia is an assistant professor of a uh, department of philosophy in Riprasa College for University of Delhi. Her primary research interests are in the field of moral philosophy, meta-ethical studies, psychology, and philosophy of emotion. She is also interested in the field of continental philosophy, philosophy of mind, and feminist studies. She has presented research papers in national and international conferences and has published articles uh, to her credit. She is the author of the paper Moral Luck, a Philosophical Problem to in Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, Springer. Her current research work concerns the philosophical examination of the relation between morality and emotions. And it is also uh, what, we will be, uh, what she will be speaking to us about today, about morality and emotions. I wonder whether it's presuppose morality or uh, do they come after our moral judgments? Or do they come well judgments i'm sure uh, she will let us know a little more about it so we welcome you dipika ma'am uh, to have you here today thank you thank you so much uh, thank you so much team csp uh, thank you so much professor sangeeta menon uh, you know for inviting me uh, to deliver this talk it's it's uh, been like such a great opportunity for me also so thank you very much uh, for for all of this coordination um I would like to actually address, you know, as my title um, suggests that I'm dealing with the question of emotions and morality. And I'll be trying to work out with some reflections on the moral worth of emotions. Now, these would be careful enough. I am right now in my words that uh, this will be like a preliminary reflections uh, that we can think of for the emotions and morality. Uh, because in itself, it's it's a very, very complicated field of study. And when I say complicated, that's primarily because of the normative account that we can think of for the question of morality in particular. Emotion, uh, emotions in itself, of course, are, you know, they are complex in nature and I'll be dealing uh, with it in a while. But uh, this whole domain of understanding, you know, the possible relationship uh, between emotions and morality in itself is quite a challenging task. So uh, in today's lecture, what I have planned, uh, given the, the time frame or you know, the duration of the lecture that I have today, I will be primarily dealing with four essential questions um, that will help us introduce uh, you know, to the question of emotions and morality and will help us understand the complexity which is kind of associated or the complexity which we can um, which we can understand when we are beginning with any study uh, that connects to the question of emotions in the moral domain. So the four central questions or the four central themes that I have in my mind to address within this framework of emotions and morality is first, of course, the question of emotions and you know what are these emotions? Because any relationship that, I, that we are trying to address about emotions with morality is incomplete without our basic understanding or basic reflection to the question of emotions in itself. So that would be like the first um, thing for me to begin with, the first thing that I would like to address. Following up that discussion, I will try to talk about and address, of course, the connection that we have about emotions and morality. And I will be doing that on account of two issues, which would be my third and the fourth theme for this particular talk. That would be about the question of moral judgment and that of moral motivation in particular, and how we can place and how emotions, you know, essentially are a part of, let's say, moral judgment and moral motivation. Can we really kind of classify them under these two uh, very, very powerfully oriented uh, moral domains? Because morality, as we all know and understand, that has its roots to the normative ought. And, you know, uh, if I say that, why do I have to be moral? I can actually go back to, let's say, Plato's or Hobbes' analysis of um, the, the normativity that is associated with morality or the question of why be moral. So uh, these would be like my four primary um, areas to, and they're very much interrelated. 
they are very much interconnected with each other. So I'll be trying my best to address, um, you know, these four themes within the within the domain of emotions and morality that I wish to discuss today. So I thought actually, you know, to start this particular lecture by uh, referring to one of a very, you know, nice papers that I that I read. Um, uh, you know, that is that is on the concept of emotion only, which is viewed from a prototype perspective. And uh, that paper uh, has been published by Beverly Furl and James Russell. And, you know, the beginning part of that paper really tells us about about the complexity which is associated with the term called emotion. So we are trying to, first of all, examine the term called emotion only. And we'll try to preliminarily reflect, of course, about what do we mean by these emotions. So, um, it goes like, you know, everyone knows, for example, what an emotion is until they are asked to give a definition. And it is this particular segment of emotions and, you know, the complexity which is, which is about defining emotions is of great importance for us to, to begin with. And the reason why I'm saying it's complex in nature, because all of us, I mean, whether, you know, if you talk about emotions called joy, or you are, let's say, for example, you're happy, or you are sad, there's, a, there's anxiety, for example, there's some kind of a distress, you are angry about something. We, there's a series of emotional experiences that all of us go through. So for example, right now, I can say that, you know, I am presenting probably this talk and, you know, I am discussing and trying to make all of you uh, reflect onto the central questions which are very important in the field of moral psychology or moral philosophy about emotions. Uh, there's a sense of slight anxiety, probably that, okay, I am delivering this and I would like this to be done in a quite clear and comprehensive way as much as possible. So um, these are some central experiences that, you know, all of us go through. And as it has been prominently said, that humans are, you know, they are those emotional beings and they are the ones who are, uh, you know, going through the, these emotional um, experiences at every step of our of our lives, well, whether we accept it, whether we deny it, to what extent are we trying to uh, picturize or you know con consider our emotions? That's a different subjective thing altogether. But the very fact that humans have this this implicit understanding of emotions becomes like a very very important thing for our uh, consideration about the question of emotions. And uh, when we understand or when we reflect on to the question of emotions we find there's a rich history of, you know, of the philosophy of emotions or of the way that it has been defined. But on the face of it, um, I'll be telling a bit about, you know, this, this uh, history of emotions and just, just a very quick way. But the very fact that emotions have, on the face of it, have been kind of considered or has given slight a negative connotation. They have been kind of considered in a way that they are, uh, you know, sort of an impediment to our critical thinking or our rational thinking process or emotions are, you know, there's a there's a rich emotion reason debate wherein there's a primacy of reason over emotions when we talk about the understanding of this, this emotional experiences altogether. So, for example, you know, if you are, let's say I give you this, this situation, consider this and see. See for yourself, how will you respond to that? So for example, let's say you hear, we are in the midst of this lecture and you hear a sudden loud noise, for example. Or for example, you, uh, you, know, you have won a prize that you have really long sought for. Or you know, if you are an animal lover, for example, then you, know, you, would, you would of course not be very happy with, uh, you know, let's say the death of your pet. So you would, you would be feeling sad if your beloved pet is dying, for example. Or, I mean, the question of embarrassment or, you know, for example, if a, if a chemist is, is someone who is an expert in their respective field is, is trying to make fool of him, his own self by, let's say, explaining Shakespeare. So the series of emotions and the complexity that we have about emotions in itself is like a very, very integral question. And, but I do not say that, you know, you will have like one strict normative definition of the question of emotion. Well, that's of course is not the case because we do have multiple theories, um, many different ways where we define emotion. So we go back to let's say ancient Greek philosophy, we have Stoics, we have Socrates, 
we have Plato, Aristotle. If we go to a more, let's say, psychological, one of the pioneer works is by William James, uh, which works as the beginning point of any inquiry concerning, let's say, what is an emotion, the paper that he published in, in the mind, the journal mind. So, um, as I said that, you know, there's a rich history about these emotions, but what is important for us to understand in this talk is that um, there is a debate whether, you know, um, can we say that the role of emotions is important, let's say, in the rational thinking. And I am now actually taking a step forward and I'm saying, can we say there's a role of emotions in our moral thinking? Can we place that emotions have any role to play? Or can we say that emotions have any status uh, in the moral domain, in something that we talk you know, about morality or ethics? And when I'm using the term called morality in this lecture, I'm very clear that I'm dealing with the normative part of it. I mean, of course, we do understand there's, I mean, I mean, different branches and there are extended, uh, you know, studies about, um, about morality as well, but the normative account. So, you know, let's say deontological ethics, if you talk about Immanuel Kant, you would find there is no space. Uh, he would not really accept emotions, not even emotions, the question of luck or any external contingency, something that has been excluded from this question of moral well-being, from this question of uh, you know, the idea of, of the, the categorical imperative or the morality that they're talking about. So in the midst of all of these, these uh, you know, different reflections that we find um, in, in the philosophical canons about emotions or in the psychological perspectives, um, if we take Socrates, for example, he would kind of accept a bit in a way that it's pleasure and pain of the soul. If you're talking about, for example, Aristotle, now Aristotle has a very, very strong reference in the question of emotions and morality, and I'll be discussing that in a while. Uh, so for Aristotle also, if you're talking about emotions, he would say that there are those feelings and you know that change meant to affect their judgment. So that's how the question of judgment will be kind of considered with the question of emotions with reference to, let's say the Aristotelian perspective. Now, this whole question of judgment and the interrelation of emotions, the question is that we are on a continuous basis are very clear and cautious of our moral behavior. So the question of agency, the question of behavior and the choice becomes extremely central uh, for us to begin our analysis on emotions. Um, if we go back to let's say Charles Darwin, then of course expressive behaviors would communicate information. Um, and that would be like emotions, you expressive there for Charles Darwin is something wherein, you know, for they are, they are, they are kind of demonstrating according to Charles Darwin uh, for their behavior, for the survival. Um, likewise, I would like to actually quote William James because he would be like the most, most important um, scholarly uh, reflection on emotions wherein for, for him as per his, his analysis, these are some, and I quote here that bodily changes follow directly the perception of the existing fact. So um, the point over here is that in spite of uh, this rich history of emotions or understanding, you know, let's say the nature of emotions that we are trying to talk about, emotions have generally, as I said, have been kind of construed as an impediment to our, to our rational thinking process, to our moral thinking process, and to our critical thinking process altogether. So someone would say that probably they are just feelings, uh, or just random occurrences, for example, mere sensations or physiological disturbances. So we can find all of these references so on. But given the fact that emotions are these complex mental states and uh, you know they, they are very much charged, they are very much uh, um, uh, philosophically charged in, in their specific context, my concern in this, in this discussion is to bring about the connection between emotions and morality. Uh, and that basically can be done at two levels. The first one is that when we are talking about the understanding of emotions, um, there's a categorization that has been done. There's a great taxonomy of emotions classification. So uh, whether it's, let's say, Paul Ekman's basic emotions, uh, you know, or culturally variant emotions, emotions remains the same. We are dealing with love, we are dealing with fear, we are dealing with the question of anger, you know, the emotions, the classification is that one broad classification, but it varies um, at different levels uh, in terms, let's say the phenomenological component, it would vary and uh, uh, that would be an essentially motivating factors for each one of us. 
But uh, when I'm dealing with this connection between emotions and morality, we can actually refer to, let's say, Paul Griff's higher cognitive emotions, which are the essential understanding for us to begin with our inquiry on emotions and morality. And more than that, this whole question of, or this whole idea about mapping the considerations which are relevant for the discussion on the moral worth of emotions, we need to address some specific uh, you know, questions that have been widely discussed by scholars, uh, whether it's the Marcio, whether you know, it's, it's, it's traditional um, Plato's Stoics contact, context, or whether it's about uh, Descartes, whether it's about Nietzsche, or for example, if I take a more positive end to moral and moral emotions would be, let's say, David Hume, uh, you know, Hutchison, Adam Smith, they are all very scholarly work who are trying to basically, you know, connect the question of emotions in their res own respective ways. But I think uh, to address the complexity which is associated with this very topic, which is emotions and morality, we need to think about whether these, you know, these uh, emotions are I mean, they are just like fleeting impulses or they are some specific feelings. Uh, what if we say that emotions have that cognitive component? What if we say that, you know, they are those highly complex, reason, responsive, rational ways of looking at the world? Um, or what if we say that, uh, you know, reflections on emotions would be like um, a central argument, let's say, in the component of decision making? These are some central questions that has been discussed, which are classified as the beginning point of the question concerning emotions and morality. And uh, when we are addressing these questions, um, we are very clear of the fact that either we will accept that emotions will affect our kind of morally praiseworthy behavior, or we will either deny the position that emotions will not kind of be included in our moral praiseworthy behavior that we are interested to examine. So given this particular notion, there is a need to re-examine, there is a need to revisit our philosophical canons, there is a need to reflect on the moral worth of emotions. And I said that I will be doing this particularly on account of two questions, which is role in moral judgment and that of moral motivation. They in itself are very, very strong, uh, charged philosophically, moral psychologically oriented subjects in study. But I would like to actually focus on uh, two scholarly works here, which is one by Robert C. Solomon, and another one is by Ronald D'Souza. There are, of course, many, many scholarly works, and you know, so you can have Martha Nazbam here, her, whose work on upheavals of thought is like a very, very important contribution. Jace Prince is currently working on, let's say, the, the question of emotions and morality. Uh, Robert C. Roberts has published a book. Uh, uh, back in like 2015, I think, uh, which is dealing with, you know, is, is mapping these, these, this relationship between emotions and morality. So we find that there is a very rich context of uh, the question of emotions and morality from both like the traditional philosophical perspective, as well as the, as well as the contemporary growing perspective that we have. Um, but what is it, uh, you know, that, that makes us consider or the, that makes us reflect on this this moral worth of emotions can we say first of all that do moral do emotions have any moral worth because on the face of it if we are trying to talk about let's say the debate of reason emotion or we are trying to talk about the emotion cognitive domain this whole idea of moral worth for emotion seems to be quite bizarre because if you talk about let's say plato or stoics or or the kantian domain altogether then they would absolutely reject it they would not really accept it because for them it's the rational course of decision that becomes very important but the point for us to understand over here is that when we are beginning or when we are trying to talk about the question of this this moral worth of emotions moral judgment and moral motivation are two essential components. There are two essential components that categorically needs to be reflected upon, that categorically needs to be addressed in, in this whole domain. And um, before I give you the details or, you know, before I give you uh, the further reflection on this connection between judgment and um, uh, motivation and the emotions context, uh, I would actually like to establish that connection uh, from that emotions studies or the theories till 
to the point of emotions and morality. And how do we connect it? We connect it through the theory that is there, which is of the cognitive theory of emotions, of the multiple theory of emotions that we have. So there are feeling theories, there are uh, phenomenological perspectives, there are many different theories um, that you will find with the study of emotions. But it is the cognitive theory of emotions that seems to be like extremely important connecting point uh, that can help us establish the fact that emotions do have a role to play in the moral life or that emotions do have a specific role to play in our decision making process and we cannot just escape the possibility of emotions from our human endeavors and it is that cognitive theory of emotion so it has been promulgated by robert c solomon it has been further extended by martha nasbaum but the roots if we take back i mean sarts discussion is very important that highlights to the cognitive theory of emotions and of course robert c solomon's work is primarily addressing the this cognitive theory of emotions what is this theory of cognitive theory of emotions in a very simple way it is just trying to establish that emotions have that cognitive component to it emotions have that cognitive capacities uh, that can that can probably help us govern our life to a great extent uh, but there is a cap there i mean you know, there's something if you're talking about the cognitive context it has to be channelized in a proper way it has to be uh, you know reflected upon in a proper way and that's where aristotle comes to our rescue uh, which is about his balanced position like the mean position so um in that way we can on account of the cognitive theory of emotions we can we can try and establish this possible connection let's say between emotions and morality and try to reflect on to the moral worth of emotions so um uh, when we understand this this connection here i think i would like to address some specific questions that has been raised by solomon only in his paper uh, uh which is which is on you know emotions and choice so the point is that uh, do we really choose our emotions you know that's where he's he's targeting that's where he's starting with the basic point that uh, that can we say that we are the ones who are choosing our emotions or can we be held responsible for our emotions can we be really held responsible for emotions is something uh, that is another segment you know which is covered under the domain of moral responsibility but i have tried i mean i'm trying to focus more on judgment and motivation to make it as crisp as possible um also to what extent do you think that emotions can be classified as disruptive or irrational in nature without any purpose so uh, robert solomon's work if we see has uh, you know suggested all of these specific questions but uh, the suggestion or the argument that solomon is really trying i mean he's done extensively well and there's a lot a lot of study that has been done by solomon of course by many other scholars as well um which basically is trying to bring our attention to this basic point that emotions are those rational uh you know components and they are something which are purposive in nature and you cannot just blindly say that they are they are irrational or they are disruptive because for the very fact that just like we are performing an action likewise we have our emotions so there's a very strong connection that has been uh you know established that has been uh presented uh by solomon and of course likewise uh, many anglo american uh, philosophers who are trying to say that uh, we are our emotions as much as we are our actions so if you would define an individual on the basis of your actions how do we place morality there's a continuous moral assessment that is coming in domain so you are assessing an individual on the basis of their actions on the basis of their choices on the basis of how well Uh, probably you know they are in their behavioral context so likewise it is that sense of emotions uh, you know that that importance of emotions uh, which is very very central and uh, very important so and that defines our individual uh, you know that our individual perspective to a great extent and of course that we are in a position to choose our emotions but one thing that we have to be clear here is that often there's a confusion between emotions and feelings right i mean there's a confusion that uh, we we kind of use it very very casually very synonymously that emotions are simple feelings i mean you can use it as feelings you are use it as synonyms i'm not saying there's anything wrong in that i mean but if you go with the with the details of the studies that are concerned and actual uh, you know the the interventions that has been made 
uh, and that's what Solomon has tried to try to address. Um, feelings are, you know, that's what he has basically tried to explain that feelings are um, simple occurrences probably, but they do not have a direction, but emotions are intentional in this context. So, and that has its connection with behavior. So for example, I'm angry at something, it is about something. There is that sense of aboutness to my emotion that I'm going through. Or, you know, if, for example, if I'm angry at, let's say, any one of my um, students probably who have missed some deadline or, um, um, I mean, there's some sort of a deadline that I gave to my student and then, you know, it has not been fulfilled, for example. So I will be angry about the fact that, you know, my student has missed that deadline that probably I asked them to, to uh, follow because of our you know, professional commitments. So um, it is this particular fact that we need to understand and has been very clearly uh, explained and examined by Solomon that emotions are essentially tied to our behavior and they are tied to our moral behavior. So if you are angry, it's basically depicted that you anger behave. If you are happy, for example, it's very much tied to your behavior and you would behave in a way that you will be happy. So for example, if you're waiting for a result and you know you are expecting like very, very good result and you know, very good, God bless that you've got that result, it will be there. It will, you know, you would, you would feel it, you would um you would um, actually celebrate it in terms of your behavior. So that is the point that we need to establish that emotions have that essential relation with the behavior and with the moral behavior also. So for example, if you're happy right now, then of course you would uh, you know, behave in a, in a morally praiseworthy way. But for example, if you're angry at something, then of course you would not behave in that morally praiseworthy way. So the question of emotions and you know, its, it's, its essential connection with, with behavior becomes a central point of our examination to reflect on to the studies concerning emotions and morality. So as Solomon has talked about that the ascription of an emotion to a person is basically, you know, an ascription to the various sorts, various kinds of behavior that the person is undertaking to. Um, and in this context, when we are saying that emotions has that essential connection with behavioral component, um, a continuation fact of this behavior, uh, behavioral component, or let's say the moral behavioral component, uh, would say, and that's what Solomon has tried to, tried to present and argue, that um, emotions then becomes our judgment, right? And uh, they are normative in nature, and uh, they are often then moral judgments. So, for example, as I said, I repeat that example of anger. So um, you anger, you are angry about something. Intentional directedness is there to that emotion. And that is resulted or that is depicted in your behavior. And that means you would anger, behave, right, for something. And in this way, the another person, for example, who is um, looking at you and who is trying to assess your, your moral worth, your individuality and your individual moral worth, would slightly have some reservations about the fact that, okay, uh, I mean, you know, this is also one side of that person. So in this way, in this context, we can have, a connection or we can think about the interrelation between emotions and moral judgment and as Robert Solomon has rightly pointed out that uh, these are emotions which are holding our normativity uh, normative judgments about one situation so again it's situational based uh, we cannot say that you know this is like forever but then uh, situation circumstances becomes very important and also, I would like to add here that with the analysis of, let's say, anger, anger as an emotion, Aristotle has presented like a detailed study of this emotion in particular. And, you know, you can find the, the reference to that in his book called Rhetoric, uh, which is basically dealing with this emotion of anger only. And, you know, uh, of course, there are a lot of other components. Aristotelian ethics is, is very rich in that way. But then it is trying to kind of bring about a reflection on anger. Likewise, for example, if I pick up another emotion, so for example, if I say uh, the question or emotion of shame, then, uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre's work, Being in Nothingness, uh, you would find there's one part, one section of the book, which is uh, addressing the problem of the other mind. And in that particular problem of the other mind, you would find that um, there's, there's, a, there's a one small quick piece of work, which is called the look, that is again addressing 
the question of shame, you know, that sense of embarrassment, that becomes very important in our, in our behavioral component. And we are very conscious in that specific domain. So um, given that fact that we are trying to establish that emotions are essentially tied. Now, uh, you, uh, we need to be very careful of the term here. I'm not saying that emotion and behavior would always go hand in hand. I'm just trying to make a point clear that they are essentially tied. And you know, this is what many scholars are also very categorically trying to play because this in itself is a very challenging position because of the subjectivity also that is a part of the do uh, domain. Or for example, and of course there are some of limitations as well to this particular point. But um, to begin with our inquiry concerning emotions and morality, uh, the basic understanding should be that, of course, referring to Solomon's work and even Robert, uh, Robert C. Roberts, Martha Nussbaum have all tried to delve into these things, of course, in their own respective ways, um, that you are responsible for your emotions, you know, as for the judgments that you make. So um, my emotions would be, you know, that kind of a judgments that that I would be making. So, for example, um, you know, um, uh, the moment we are interacting, uh, my, my seniors are here, my colleagues are here, uh, very experienced uh, professors are here. So there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of an engagement that is involved here. And uh, whatever I am feeling right now, while even delivering the lecture, is assessed at the another end, right? And that is the complexity that we address within the question, within the domain of emotions and morality. So uh, in this way, we do understand that emotions and moral judgments can become kind of quite relatable in that way. And uh, an implicit understanding of emotions and moral judgment can be traced to the moral motivation question, which is that these are um, emotions have that motivating component. So the question of moral motivation, which is very central to the examination, is that what really motivates us to be moral? I mean, what are the reasons or what are the ways on the basis of which I can say that, you know, I'm motivated to perform something? Why do I have to be moral at the very first go? And, you know, what is that central element for us to be, uh, you know, that is motivating us to be moral? So um, there are many answers. And of course, as I said, that the question of what motivates us to be moral or why we should be moral can be traced back historically, philosophically, to Plato's work in his Republic and also uh, Hobbes' question of social contract, which is like the very basic thing of the representation regarding, let's say, individuality or humanity or community as a whole. But um, it has been argued very, uh, very, um, you know, clearly that emotions have that considerable motivational force to them. Um, and, you know, it is that particular motivational force then further connects us with the with the judgment part because all of these things are very much within the ambit of our moral behavior so um when i say that moral motivation again is a very very important domain then um i'm now placing moral motivation in connection with moral judgment and when i'm doing that of course you know we can have references from which are very scholarly works, philosophically scholarly works from Francis Hutchison and you know, David Hume and Adam Smith. And currently, if you see Jonathan, he is someone who is really working um, and trying to uh, you know, talk about the, the essential role that emotions play in our, in our moral life. And you would find one common thing that all of these scholars are trying to argue and they are holding this position that moral judgments express in, in one or the another way, these emotional attitudes. So moral judgments, they have that motivational force, and then they are, uh, you know, kind of expressing our emotional attitudes to a great extent. And even if we go back to, you know, David Hume, for example, so you would find in his work that uh, moral judgments, again, is essentially tied to motivation, just like we have initially said that emotions are tied to behavior and behavioral component, likewise, we are saying that uh, you know uh, emo uh, that moral judgments are essentially tied again to this motivation fact, which in turn is getting us to the emotional context. So also, I mean, you know, we can trace it back to A.J. Ayer's uh, very historic and classic work, uh, *Language, Truth, and Logic*. And I would like to quote, you know, present a quotation here from his work uh, in 1936 that uh, in every case in which 
one would commonly be said to be making an ethical judgment, the function of the relevant ethical world is purely emotive in nature. It is used to express feeling about certain objects, but not to make any assertion about them. So we are trying to, um, you know, and that's what has been argued here that uh, there is there's this always continuous need to work with assertions that assertiveness. The assertiveness that we can place regarding the question of emotions and morality is something, you know, about, let's say, the nature of emotions in a way that they are intentional, they are something which are directed, they are something which are about something, and, you know, there's a sense of aboutness to it. Uh, but in continuation of this discussion, and, you know, to go a step further with our reflections on moral emotions or uh, the question of the moral worth of emotions, there are two central themes that needs to be again kept in mind. One is that about that we are assessing. So there's a there's a regular sense of moral assessment which becomes very important. Uh, and the second one is about the moral judgment that we are making on the basis of emotions. So these are the two central themes that you will also find in, in very, very prominent works by Ronald uh, D'Souza. Um, again, a very, very uh, pioneer work, I would say, very a wonderful piece of work, Rationality of Emotion, uh, you know, that has been addressed. So his paper also, Moral Emotions, is something which is very classic. Uh, with reference to the two themes that I've mentioned here, or you can say these are two questions, again, which are kind of clubbed under the addressing or reflection on to the question of emotions and morality. The first one, which is moral assessment of emotions, that is something that we can trace it uh, throughout, ever since Stoics, then, uh, you know, Plato and Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Nietzsche, Adam Smith, Hutchison, um, uh, uh, Anthony Kenny also, as a matter of fact, uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, as a matter of fact. So you have so many references which are either denying or they are accepting emotions, uh, having any moral worth. But it's the second particular question, which is regarding the moral judgment made on the basis of the emotions that becomes very important. And that has been picked up by even Ronald D'Souza in, in, his, in his scholarly work. And he's primarily concerned with these two questions and he has referred continuously, there's a reference to an emotion of compassion and sympathy. And um, claiming that they are very, uh, you know, specifically they are moral uh, uh, in, in our context. And the terminology that I would like to focus here that has been used by Ronald D'Souza while making an emphasis on your, uh, this, this whole question of moral judgment made on the basis of emotion is that of moral consciousness and behavior. So, uh, you know, it is, it is this kind of an analysis uh, that uh, brings an understanding. Now, the term called moral consciousness in, its, in itself is like very much demanding. In itself is something which is, uh, you know, very much um, um, rich in its context. And uh, we find traces of uh, the reference to moral consciousness um, and behavior. So we are using moral consciousness and behavior within the within the domain of emotions and morality, which becomes very important for us. And of course, that um, uh, Ronald D'Souza's work also is trying to give us an explanation that uh, uh, you know emotions are moral. They are they are something which are uh, taking us to motivate our own selves. Let's say have a motivating uh, component, and of course, essentially tied to the question of. Um, behavior which is important there are a couple of uh, you know the classification as i said that emotions has a very rich taxonomy or you know and a very very great classification has been done so basic emotions there are cultural variants uh, there are higher cognitive emotions altogether um but likewise you have like a different different components that has been categorized so you know you have phenomenological component of emotions, there's perceptual component, and all of this has been wonderfully explained by Mark Elfano, uh, you know, in the book called Moral Psychology, um, uh, wherein for us, in, in, in terms of our connection that we are trying to establish or discuss uh, on, you know, on account of uh, morality or the normativity, which is, which is inherently present in the moral domain, is about the motivational component. And to explain that point, I would like to uh, you know, give you this one situation. Um, uh, and I want you to think about it as in, you know, uh, is it something that is applicable to you as a person or is something that, you know, you would like to consider the situation um, given the particular fact? And it goes like this. So, for example, you're like very angry uh, when you are uh, green eyed with envy, uh, with envy, I repeat, uh, you want to take for yourself what someone else has. Or, you know, when you are overcome with guilt, for example, 
you want to let's say apologize and make some amends uh, or let's say you're when you're filled with wonder um, then you want to stare and drink in the object of wonder so you know this is the kind of emotional um, stimulation which is which is present in all of us uh, but we do of course react and kind of work it out in multiple different ways the point that is you know why i have used this particular um, situational based behavioral representation over here is to talk about the connections between let's say emotions and then moral motivation and this particular connection that i want because you know you're motivated if you're envy if you're for example if you're envy then you know you are like it's a struggle or or if you are let's say you're guilty about something you would like to apologize so there's there's always this sort of an inherent connection between again emotion and what is motivating you to perform an action in a specific way and it is this particular context or situation that we can refer to to bring about further understanding of the question of moral motivation and its relation with emotions and that has been addressed again with reference to the debate that exists in this domain which is about motive externalist and motive internalist or you can say motive externalism and motive internalism uh, motive externalism is a very simple way would just be about that you know motivation is something which is independent from from moral judgment so that you know when you're making a moral judgment um, it's it is one is not really motivated as such to act in accordance with our judgment but for us in when we are reflecting when we are talking about emotions and morality it is the motive internalism which is very important because motive internalism would have a position that there is a necessary connection between um, you know moral judgments and um, motivation and they essentially involves emotions so um, of course it's, it's like again long debate altogether that i think would uh, would uh, i think i'm i need to kind of um, uh, kind of summarize it in a quick way now so the point that you know um, i would like to propose or i would like to argue for on the basis of the discussions that i have tried to uh, you know uh, briefly present over here now as i said these are very preliminary reflections and you know um, uh, it's a great detailed study altogether and this is just the beginning part of understanding the fact that moral worth is there for emotions and emotions do have that moral worth and it is something that you can philosophically place in, in different canons there are there are different scholars who are working for it it uh, even for the ones let's say who are absolutely against it would have some space for emotions to a greater extent because emotion seems to form that one epitome of our human nature and it it goes without saying that human life or human experience would be um, you know absolutely um, it it cannot be without your emotional experiences and the stimulations that you have so given that fact i would like to actually emphasize on to this one uh, one argument that i have trying to uh, you know make it as clear as possible that emotions um are important and you know they do have a moral worth and when i say that do have a moral worth i would actually try to place this particular account with reference to the aristotelian tradition now if you remember or if you know about aristotelian tradition you would find that this whole idea of a mean position is essential for a virtuous flourishing life emotions and virtues in itself is a very very separate strong debate altogether um, but when we are talking about aristotelian position it's basically as he would would like to point out that it's the right kind of emotion uh, to the right degree and the right time so you know it's it's this fact that actually adds to the moral worth of emotion and becomes essentially important in our good human flourishing life which is the keyword and even ronald de souza in his work is trying to defend this particular perspective of aristotelian you know right emotions at the right degree the right time um the idea is to channelize it properly the idea is uh, not to overdo it so you cannot just be at two extremes it has to be like a very very balanced position altogether and uh, it is this particular perspective that further you know could be and i would like to uh, wrap up and conclude the session here by making two more points which is one that when you talk about moral uh, progress it is emotional it is emotional moral progress now by talking about emotions please do not consider that in any which way we are undermining the role of reason 
you know it's not that if we are talking about emotional we are talking about the rational cognitive aspect of emotions we are not saying um i mean we are not going at a at a point where i'm i'm saying that emotions are everything and then reason is nothing that is absolutely not what the case is um the point is that it's the cognitive capacity of emotions it's the cognitive uh, component you know uh, of emotions of understanding emotions uh, which is governed you know in a way uh, uh, in a way which is very much comprehensive which is very much regulative in its context and uh, would take into account the adequate emotional response and that would add to the further moral assessment of emotions and we can actually trace it back again as i said to the aristotelian uh, you know ethics uh, virtue ethics is is a very very important domain in the in the when we are establishing emotions and morality and virtue ethics has a very very important segment to make but uh, to conclude the point uh, or to to finally you know wrap up the discussion yes we talked about emotions i'll just give you a quick uh, one uh, one wrap up that will help me connect to the final point that i want to make uh yes we talked about emotions we understood it from the from the perspective or we tried to reflect different historical you know perspectives that we can trace for the understanding of emotions um of the theories of emotions that we have it is the cognitive theory of emotions um you know that has been promulgated by by robert c solomon further extended carried forward by martha nussbaum robert c roberts is extensively working again um that takes us to the to the interconnection that we are trying to establish between emotions and morality and i particularly have uh, you know focused on judgment and motivation as essentially tied to the question of behavior so actions behavior choice responsibility agency all of these things are like extremely important questions to to begin with when we are reflecting on emotions and morality domain and given that particular fact um uh, aristotelian perspective is is essential and that's what i would like to support and extend here in terms of my argument when i'm saying that emotions do have a moral worth and emotions have an essential role to play in the moral life of an individual um that would be from the aristotelian perspective and and given his work of of the comian ethics i would just like to you know um Uh, finally give one this specific quotation from his work only uh, which is if virtues are concerned with actions and passions every passion and every action is accompanied by pleasure and pain if you remember socrates pleasure and pain of the soul so um, for this reason also virtue will be considered with pleasures and pain and in continuation with them but to feel them at the right time with reference to the right objects that means it's directional in nature towards the right people with the right motive in the right way is what is both intermediate and best and this is the characteristic of virtue so um to conclude finally yes emotions and morality in itself is of course a very very prominent challenging domain to reflect on because of the complexity which is which uh, with which it is it is uh, you know reflected upon or concerned but uh we cannot just say that emotions are some blind urges or there are some you know um random occurrences altogether that would not have any space in the moral domain uh emotions have a very very important role to the moral domain and that is something which is interconnected with our moral behavior so thank you very much uh, thank you so much uh, professor menon for uh, giving me this opportunity to present um, whatever limited i could i think uh, with you know to to all these lovely um, you know intelligent young minds and experts in the field so uh, yes thank you very much thank you very much for having me here thank you thank you so much ma'am for the fantastic lecture uh, we definitely learned a lot about emotion so thank you for, uh, so much for that now i'll request uh, meera kumar menon the chairperson of today's uh talk to begin with her comments then we'll start the question and answer session for a brief uh time mira over to you thank you niharika and thank you ma'am for that very very interesting uh, lecture so firstly i wanted to say that uh, uh the distinction between emotions and feeling where you gave a ground you know uh, about how emotions are directed and intentional and has a certain kind of aboutness about them was was uh, an interesting point to begin with and uh, i have i couldn't help but remember uh, our shakespeare's hero hamlet who very who was very perplexed uh, 
perhaps with a lot of emotion or perhaps without any and who asked to be or not to be and was stuck wondering whether he should or should not kill um, his father. So um, that said, I, um, I have two questions. One is about, I think both are probably about bi-directionality. So I was wondering, um, first of all, are our emotions, um, our responses to something or do we respond due to our emotions? So how does how does that come about? I mean, it is it is more like asking whether the chicken comes first or the egg. Regardless, I think it is an interesting question to ask. Mm -hmm. And the second question is about um, um, yeah about the the bidirectionality of this thing again. Um, are our emotions controllable? Like, do we have an agency over our emotions? or do our emotions control us? So how does that work out according to you? And um, yeah, I mean, I'm throwing a couple of questions more if that is okay. So um, I, I forget uh, the psychological term for this, but there is something called a facial appreciation hypothesis or something to that effect, where you say that you can kind of like influence how you uh, how your your whole mood and your emotions so uh, does fake it till you make it actually work like is that a possibility when it comes to emotions and uh, behavior so these are my uh, initial questions to your uh, right. okay. Thank you. okay thank you so much Mira for for those uh, wonderful questions um, to begin with to answer your first question I think which is primarily dealing with um, you know, the fact that emotions and, you know, how do we respond? Do we respond to emotions first or responses are like an outcome of our emotional thing? This has been actually a central question um, in the beginning of uh, the theories of emotions, because when emotions uh, really, when, I mean, when scholars really started studying and uh, everybody was trying to understand the question of emotions, um, they, of course, were confused and uh, there was this whole thing whether it's the bodily changes that is taking you to the feelings or the feelings or emotions are taking you to some sort of a expression. So that's how even expression is, is also coming into domain. I think um, this whole idea of response and I mean, if you are dealing from the psychological point of view, then it has a detailed different orientation to it. But I would limit my answer to the moral context, right? Uh, the moral context, we are very categorically, I'm very categorically trying to present or trying to argue for the fact that it is, it is uh, the channelization which becomes very important. Emotions by default are a part of human existence, right? We, we cannot really help but have emotions in every domain of our, of our existence. So, um, instead of using or instead of saying that whether you know emotions are the one which is taking to the bodily changes or you know it's it's the responses that we have then we are having an emotional outburst um from the moral point of view if you are understanding the debate then uh, again if we go back to robert c solomon's work um when you're when you are feeling an emotion when you are undergoing any kind of an emotional stimulation you would find that in your behavior, you would find that in your, um, in your, the way you are conducting yourself. So um, if someone who is very sad, right, sadness is a result of an event. It's a result of a situation. It's situational based, it's circumstantial based. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a degree of subjectivity, which is also a part of that context. But sadness is that one universal emotion, which is you know, about a specific event. So probably the person would not say anything and the person would probably go in isolation. That is one possibility. Or another possibility is that the person would just be very quiet and would not really um, indulge more in any kind of an interaction, for example, with anybody. So his behavioral representation would actually be a result of the emotion that he's going through. So in that way, uh, from the moral point of view, and I'm strictly saying from the moral point of view, because when we study psychology, there are different theories of emotions. Uh, there's Canon Brad, there's 
uh, William James Lang theory of emotion. So um, when we study these, this this emerged from the same debate of the same question that you have just mentioned. I mean, how do we classify which comes first, like chicken or egg? It's, it's the same sort of a question. But uh, it's basically, uh, you know, William James, again, the bodily feelings and uh, the point that we are trying to establish that emotions are are identical with our feelings and you know there are something which uh, our perceptions of our certain bodily changes so there's a long debate and that's how the that's how the rich history of emotions really began with the central question but uh, from the moral point of view it is as i said essentially tied to your behavior so if someone is feeling sad um, um the moral assessment is a different thing but then how do you how do you how do you know that the person is really sad or is angry or is happy it's in context of what they are representing behaviorally. They might not intentionally would like to be uh, to represent. I mean, for example, if I'm going through an emotion and I'm interacting with you, there's a possibility I don't want you to go through what I'm feeling right now. Or you would not like me to go to understand what you are feeling or what the emotion that you're having at the given point of time. But it is still depicted in the way we are conducting ourselves. And that's where morality also comes in, the moral conduct, right? That's the central thing with reference to our moral domain. So I think that would be my answer to your, to your first question, uh, which is from the moral point of view, given the fact that when we are talking about this, uh, which comes first, it's actually, um, we go through emotion, emotional stimulations, emotional experiences, and the moral assessment or the moral judgments or everything related to the moral domain, the normative segment, is something that is depicted in the way we are conducting ourselves and that's where the connection would establish i forgot your second question if you can uh, please the second the question. second question was about uh, control and agency like whether whether we have a control over emotions or do they control um us? again there are two perspectives to this emotions uh, you know i mean first we have to understand why they have been construed as disruptive uh, features or disruptive uh, factors of our any cognitive rational domain because of the fact that probably there are times where there's no control over emotions. But uh, from the moral domain, when we are trying to establish this, this particular connection between emotions and morality um, and going to the Aristotelian tradition and working with the human flourishing point of view or the morally praiseworthy behavior that we are interested to examine, there is a uh, there is this point that emotions are something which has to be within control. If they are not within control, the question of morality would lapse, right? If they are not within control, if they are not something which are within the bounds of our own rational control, because the control is always rational. Control cannot, if you are regulating something, it has to be rationally sound. It has to be reasonably sound. So emotions in that way, from the cognitive point of view, which we are placing in the, in the moral domain, has to have that connection, um, you know, with the reasonable, uh, with the reasonable account, and that's why they are, you know, within our control. And uh, as Solomon is, uh, you know, all trying to argue that it is something that we choose our emotions. By saying we choose our emotions, it's not that okay. Today I want to be happy. Let's be happy. Or today I want to be sad. Let's be sad. It's not that kind of a choice we are making. The choice that we are trying to establish in the in the discussion of moral psychology or the question of, um, of uh, moral domain or meta-ethical studies uh, is basically with reference to, again, agency, rational, you know, responsibility. So in all of those parameters, emotions within the moral context, within, uh, within this particular, um, you know, domain of morality has to be, um, you know, charged, has to be controlled. Um, has to be um, something which is reasonably sound. And that's where we often go back to the cognitive theory of emotions, um, talking about the cognitive component or the you know, cognitive element when we are trying to define those emotions. Right, so that would be my answer. Thank you, ma'am. Just, uh, just something to, uh, something more to, uh, I was just wondering, um, so would, would that then mean that we should make a distinction between our emotions and the responses that you know are derived from or are elicited by emotions? I, mean, uh, I think uh, what you were also saying is that we could probably control our responses which are coming out from our emotions, but perhaps 
the if the question is whether we can control our emotions themselves like for instance you said we can't like choose one day whether we can be sad or happy but perhaps what we do with our sadness or happiness is something that we can control that so, is the central point to address from the moral which you know you yourself have answered that question uh, which is yeah. about you know the the point that we are trying to address with reference to emotions or you know in terms of our control in terms of our choice in terms of um, the basic uh, the idea is to regulate right and uh, of course um, uh, when we are dealing with emotions um, it's not easy it's not easy i mean it's not easy that i would say that you have to control your emotions and you will be in a position to control your emotions or if i say that this is not the time calm down you need to relax yourself you are in a public place for example and you will take your own time the idea is that emotional stimulation as i said forms the epitome or uh, you know the basic it's, it's like a it's like a groundwork that we all live with uh, at different levels at different degrees uh, and you know it's something that is a part of our everyday practices altogether but um, regulation i think would be my answer uh, i won't say there's i won't say that everybody of course they they have different ways to respond and they have different ways to address to any specific situation but within the ambit of emotions and morality um this whole question of cognitive again cognitive question response and control and choice becomes central domains for us to at least learn about our own selves so i think yeah that would be from my side <laughs> Thank, thank you, ma'am. I'm sure there'll be more questions. So, Niharika, if you could yes. facilitate. Yes. Thank you, Mira, for your comments, and thank you, ma'am, for the answers. If there are any questions, you may please raise your hands or type it out on the chat box. We'll be able to unmute you so you can ask your questions. Oh, yeah, Safeki, please go ahead. And this this hand thing is so cute now. I'm glad there is this function now. Um, so, hello, ma'am. Thank you so much for this. great talk and i'm very much interested in emotions so my question doesn't directly come from cognitive theory but you also mentioned that are there are phenomenological theories as well but in in cognitive theory itself especially from de souza's accounts um there's this particular um, aspect of feeling emotions emotions feel in a certain way feeling sad feels you know unpleasant and feeling happy feels pleasant so i mean unless we are like strict representationalists saying that it's another kind of thing to consider so um my question is um where would be the urgent necessity to recruit uh, moral in intuitions um in terms of you know whether we do it in the in the uh, phenomenology of feeling in a certain negative or positive way or in the way that we express them I, I'm not getting into you know conscious and unconscious emotions or you know emotions that we are not aware of, but um, like in a in a brief sense, it's it's a huge domain. Um, how I, how um, how intrinsically are emotions intersubjective in the in the in the moral discussions? Is it about the way we feel and the way we regulate ourselves, or the way we think we are supposed to regulate the way we express them? it also kind of ties a bit to mira's question of you know um fake it till you make it kind of kind of argument right okay thank you thank you so much devi for that uh, that question and i think i'll pick up two things from what you are trying to ask one is about the intuitive uh, ways of looking at emotions and the another one is again in terms of expressions and uh, which is of course interconnected with mira's question uh, regarding i mean you fake it and then you are good to go whether you are really good to go when you fake it so uh, these are of course important things now regarding the first one which is the intuitive understanding uh, can we say that our emotions are intuitively i mean can i say that i am intuitive about my emotions or uh, you rightly said that there's a detailed uh, domain about emotions and intuition as well right even within the moral psychological domain not just about emotions and intuition emotions and virtue emotions and thinking you will have all of these sub classifications uh, when we are uh, beginning with the question of emotions and morality in moral psychology the point that i i think would like to um, briefly mention over here is that intuitiveness of emotions in itself is something uh, which which is something that as is understood at two levels one it's uh, you know it's it's about paul ekman's uh, 
uh, understanding of basic emotions because for uh, if you begin with the basic emotions questions then you know they are universal they are innate there's a sense of intuitiveness to it but then that has been kind of again challenged uh, challenged in a way that they have not been rejected so we are not questioning or rejecting the intuitiveness about those emotions because as i said earlier uh, human nature and emotional experiences go hand in hand and of course it varies from one person to another which is a subjective uh, way of responding to your your emotional experiences altogether but um, that's where you know paul grip come into into place and you know he gave his his work on the higher cognitive theory of emotions um, wherein the question of universality or innateness or intuitiveness about emotions has not been rejected that way there there are limitations there are reservations there are uh, ways where we would like to cancel them for example because then it becomes very subjective and then there is no objectivity to it in that case if you if you talk about those intuitivity and then how do you manage how do you control your emotions specifically when you're talking from the moral point of view but the element that paul griff again have argued and there are many other scholars which is with the fact that intuitivity or intuitiveness of emotions um, could be correlated with uh, you know the the idea of those those basic thing that we have about the nature of emotions um but we have another categorization to begin with in the moral domain and that categorization comes from the cognitive capacity which is like the cognitive elements altogether so we are not in a position to sideline or to you know kind of um, absolutely overrule that intuitive intuitiveness that you are trying to um, uh, you know reflect on or examine but the idea is that we need to have that enterprise or we need to have that level of understanding where we can regulate that that idea of emotional or you know of of celebrating emotions for example at a very very personal level so um emotions and intuitions is a categorization of course and intuitions would be uh, you know because there are when when we talk about the the phenomenological component of emotions as i said there are many components of which phenomenological or perceptual component is is another is another um, component of emotions at the phenomenological level of emotions then you know intuitivity or uh, subjectivity at that levels could very much be placed because it is dealing with experience it is dealing with your own experience so for example your experience of of happiness would be different from another person's experience of ha happiness likewise your your experience or the way you are responding for example to anger would be different from how another person would experience and respond to that anger um but when we are talking or when we are trying to uh, you know address uh, this emotions and intuitions uh, very categorically uh, from the moral point of view it has to be as ronald de souza and even martha nazbam as a matter of fact would uh, would really hold this position that cognitive association or cognitive channelization i would rather say that becomes very important to even deal and address with that intuitiveness which you are talking about. okay and uh, to an answer to the second question which i think i missed for mira's part which was about fake emotions and you know um i think it was that only so you fake an emotion and then you're good to go or for example if you just don't fake an emotion you're as real as possible um i think um this is like in itself like a detailed study of uh, of about dealing with your own self 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 consciousness i mean you know we have like a, a wonderful a wonderful um Uh, rich discourses which are available for self consciousness and and the consciousness and the question of self in itself but uh, the idea of faking an emotion uh, within the moral domain and then expressing it is also a very complicated thing to deal with because uh, we we do not sideline the possibility that that you can fake an emotion and then you know um, then what about your moral assessment if you for example if you fake an emotion and then you get a receipt and then you receive a very very wonderful moral assessment then in itself is a trap right but then how do you deal with that trap so i think that's a question that needs to be discussed and addressed and i'll i'll think about that particular point as to how we can place the question of fake emotions in our in our moral domain thank you for for raising that point both mira and safety that has given me a sense of um you know it it has given me 
a point to actually think about because um, faking an emotion is quite easy, right? And people are, uh, they, they do it. Uh, but uh, I think I, I would like to think about that specific point and see how well I can, I can get to an answer within the ambit of the moral domain that uh, I'm trying to address. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, Sevki, for uh, the questions. Uh, Sevki is also a doctoral scholar. Uh, Sevki, uh, do you mind giving a short introduction about yourself, your research? I am not a doctoral student yet. I'm somewhere in between kind of pre-doctoral post masters. <laughs> But yes, I've been very much interested in understanding um, phenomenology of pain. And that is also very much important for me to understand how emotion plays a role in that. So I have been very much happy to be part of this talk and especially the, the other talks that um, the um, group is organizing. So yes, I've just graduated from IIT Gandhinagar from a main society and culture. So now I'm just in Istanbul trying to find my way out of this uh, solitude and join academia again. So thank you so much for thank having me. Thank you. Me. Okay, I, uh, I'll request uh, Manish Chopra. Sir, are you here? Sir, please go on. So you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself in a line or two and please proceed with your question then. Uh, thank you, Niyarika. My question, uh, uh, sorry, uh, my introduction is uh, I am uh, I'm an independent engineer, uh, researcher working in the fields of sports uh, for performance analytics. Uh, I'm quite interested in the topic uh, just because uh, there is this sense of morality that has sort of sunk in, in, in with, the, uh, with the experiences so far. I've been mostly looking, uh, mostly looking uh, into the medical uh, medical definition of, uh, uh, in the medical areas specifically because that's where they uh, I, I mean I feel that the most trusted work might be from the field uh, my question is um, are moral entities rational to regulate emotions moral entities rec uh, Reg, uh, rational, uh, rational to regulate emotions. I didn't get your question. I mean, like, uh, 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 are the morals uh, itself rational? Uh, are they? Uh, I mean, rationality comes from economics point of view, and uh, it's uh, mostly uh, so. When it comes to the rationality, in uh, uh, so it's is it only uh, between the relationships? between the human beings or, uh, or rather morality also comes in uh, terms of how uh, emotions actually feel about material or uh, so uh, okay. what is the scope? Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your question. Uh, as I've understood, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, you are trying to basically, uh, you know, understand or question about the rationality of just morals, right? And and you're trying to work out with, uh, for example, is it is it only humans, or can we extend it to any other uh, any other species, for example, or any other materiality regarding uh, the morals domain? So um, the rationality of morals. Um, see, as I said initially in the very beginning of my talk, that uh, addressing morality also has a lot of segments to it. And uh, we just do not say morality as simple moral rules or something. Um, it could be applied at, you know, or it's an applied version also. It's something which is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the beyond the applied version also. So there's different categorizations that we can think of within even the moral domain. What I have picked up in terms of my analysis for emotions and morality is a very, very normative account. Now, by normativity, it's the question of ought. We are very clear that you ought to do this. And morality in that way would be very rational, right? So my answer to your question that whether we can think of the rationality of morals, we cannot go without the rationality of morals in the human endeavors if it's not reasonably in place. Because we are dealing with society, we are dealing with community at large, and that's where you can, you can even refer to Hobbes' analysis, this whole question of social contract or um, Plato's work on Republic and his concept of justice, it cannot be in place under, unless we do not have that rational cognitive component in place even for morals. 
so um, even applied ethics or you know um, uh, just descriptive ethics probably would also have that rational moral components so we cannot really begin with the question of morality without um, having that rational component in place there. so yes my answer is is absolutely that we do have the rationality of morals in particular but that is then further extended and defined at different levels at different ways with different degrees and then you know it goes on and is extended further uh, with reference to your second point which is concerning materiality um, when we deal with uh, the question of morality um, and when we are trying to pictureize human nature or when we are trying to say that uh, you know it's the epitome of everything regarding our human endeavors um, materiality cannot be in the sense that materiality is always a part of our human experience but um, i won't say that this rationality of morals would exclude the question of materiality but then it has its limited scope it has its limited way and that's what has been discussed in the normative ethics that beyond the regular course of the material things which you need because if we go to aristotle even you know um, the question of wealth in that case also has some relevance in order to lead a flourishing life but then it is not only about leading a flourishing life you cannot say that someone who is wealthy is a some is that man or is that woman who is leading a good flourishing human life which we try to define at the levels of morals so um materiality is a component that is a part of a human uh, life altogether and we all of us need our basic bread and butter so that goes without saying but then we cannot consider materiality to be like an absolute final thing regarding our domain of that virtuous life or that moral life that we are trying to strive for and emotions in that context again becomes very relevant so because for somebody uh, you know we can also say that materiality would be would be being happy or someone uh, you know who is very um, materialistic in their approach would say probably that uh, you know if you have everything material then you know you're having a good flourishing life but the moral normative account there are set of standards that that are there which are considered in the normative domain um that would not exclude completely blindly the material con component but it will have its reservations it will have its specific limitations because ultimately the idea of a good flourishing life or the moral life is about you know um is about uh having that sense of contentment that's what i think aristotle is also saying eudaimonia is something which is also human flourishing which is also well being right so in that way of course it's it's uh, quite con uh, contested and um, materiality would have a, a limited role i think that would be uh, my perspective and also when i'm talking about emotions and morality it's not just about humans i mean we have a detailed study for animal ethics which is a part of the discussions and you know these are another debates that you can face with reference to uh, different species and emotions in that context and that's like a different way of um, another extended discussion is needed to address that particular domain of uh, how emotions and another species would be applicable and is it just human so yeah thank you so much ma'am sir for the question and also thank you ma'am for the answer um, as we are running a little short of time we'll take up uh, one last question uh, meera will be opening up both the uh, chat groups on whatsapp uh, so you can ask all your questions there if we have missed any of your questions uh, the chat will be open for an hour so please feel free to ask uh, any questions or any comments that you want to make on the lecture or uh, any discussion you want to continue on on the whatsapp group so meera will be opening up uh, the whatsapp group uh, immediately after this lecture i'll read the last question um so th this is by uh, merli sebastian she's actually in her office so she can't really um, unmute herself and speak so i'll just uh, uh, read her question her question is according to you what would be the best way to uh, begin to control or manage emotions <laughs> all right that in itself is like a very very challenging task <laughs> managing emotions and controlling emotions but i think um um handling your emotions um needs a lot of input and that is like very much uh, you need a lot and lot of self uh, uh, input i think i would rather say that so um i do not think so that i am in any capacity uh, to kind of tell you about 
the starting point of managing emotions. But I think on the basis of uh, whatever limited research I do on a regular basis or, you know, uh, because it's limit, I say it's limited because all of us are always at the beginning point, no matter how, uh, how much we have conducted a research or how much we are studying, we still, I think it's better to consider yourself always at a minimum basic level rather than just um, saying that you know everything. So I think um, the best way to begin to control or manage your emotions, if I have to answer that, is just to think and, you know, to think rationally. So because um, every answer regarding reason and emotions, you will find, you know, in your own self uh, when you will uh, reflect on your own self and your actions and everything. And then you will get an answer as to um, how well you have to deal with it. So more than managing, controlling, I think it's about dealing with your emotions and dealing it the right way. So um, yeah, I think that would be uh, one small guidance <laughs> from my side regarding emotions uh, and you know dealing with it is very important. So um, as long as we are in a position to rationally reflect on our own situations, because of course situations vary, there are different circumstances, we are coming from different perspectives, um, um, that all is a part of our, our community, our, our human endeavors, but then um, it's extremely and essentially important to learn to regulate and, and you know, the way we respond because uh, that would then define uh, who you are in that way. So rationality again is always at the best, it's like a survivor uh, in, in any ways, it's, it's also a savior for all of us even in terms where we are not in a position to control our emotions, but then rational, just one rational thought will, will obviously help you to deal with it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll now request uh, Mira to uh, please give the official uh, vote of thanks. Mira, over to you. Thank you, Harika. And uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for being very patient and answering so many questions as well. Uh, along with that great lecture that you gave us. So I also see a couple of questions. I mean, I think there is one question here for sure. So we will take all of those in the WhatsApp group since we are running a little short of time. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, Deepika ma'am will answer them there as well. Yes, I have, please add me to your WhatsApp group. I have, I have yeah. added you to your group, so okay, yeah. Right. So that I can right. respond, I can answer, yes. Sure, sure. So, uh, so yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deepika ma'am, for this very interesting lecture. And I should also uh, thank Dr. Sankita Menon for conceptualizing this whole Friday lecture series. And Neharika, who always uh, keeps us uh, online with uh, controlling the Zoom and all of that. And all of you all who take a very active interest and come participate in all our events. So we look forward to your participation in our upcoming events as well. So thank you, everybody, and uh, hope to see you uh, in the next upcoming Friday lecture. Yeah, I would just like to add one point here, uh, which is thank you so much, uh, you know, Professor Menon, uh, for giving me this opportunity. So, um, um, you know, my, my interactions with you, you are one inspiration, of course. And I would also like to thank, uh, you know, your team, uh, uh, Consciousness Studies Program, for engaging in such quality uh, you know, engaging, there's a regular engagement that, you know, I see, I follow uh, Mias on a very, very regular basis. And I remember and cherish always, and I, that's what I told to Sangeeta ma'am as well the other day that I always cherish uh, five years back when I, uh, when I visit to your campus, which is a very beautiful, peaceful, pe uh, you know, place to sit and study. So that was my, um, you know, um, observation and uh, it's been a wonderful so uh, in terms of the Friday lecture series or whether it's about the different courses that you're organizing and all of you are on toes. So congratulations to all of you, uh, to Niharika, who's a wonderful coordinator actually. And, you know, she's been coordinating really well. Uh, to Mira for, you know, all her questions that even made me think about the specific, uh, you know, ideas or areas dealing within the context of emotions. So thank you very much once again for, for having me here and for being patient enough to listen to what I have to say. So thank, thank you, you very much, everybody. Thank you, you. ma'am. On behalf of Team CSP, thank you all of you.